Hey, everybody. The deadline to get your application in for the spring vintage of Village Global Accelerator is March 1st. Companies that have been through the Accelerator have raised from some of the best venture funds in the world, like A16Z, Lux, Spark, Bessemer, Founders Fund, and many more. Learn more and apply at villageglobal.vc slash accelerator. Hey, everybody. It's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Village Global's Venture Stories. I'm here today joined by a very special returning guest, David Fauchier. David, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me on again. So, David, for, for those who didn't catch our last podcast, why don't you introduce yourself and what you're currently focused on? Um, yeah, sure. I work at a firm called Nickel Digital. It's a big uh, crypto asset manager in London. And I joined quite recently. I used to run a fund of funds in the crypto space called Cambrial Capital. And so I've been talking to traders in crypto for full time for the past three years um, and investing in the space uh, one way or another since 2013. Um, and I joined Nickel quite recently to build up a, a new fund for them called, um, well, which called Nickel Factors, but which is uh, pretty much kind of a, what we're trying to build there is a millennium for crypto. And um, millennium is a really big um, hedge fund in, in the traditional space that was the first to sort of invent this model of saying, instead of us doing all of the trading, why don't we just kind of raise some money and uh, we'll let any smart trader come and trade our capital and we'll just oversee them. And so we've built what's what's now known as a multi-manager platform. And uh, yeah, kind of consider this a, a call to arms to, to anyone listening. If you're generating like a high sharp uh, strategy, doing something interesting trading wise, in crypto markets, we would really love to chat and share notes and see if we can be helpful in any way. That's the the core of what we do. And and why don't you give a, a big background of what kind of strategies you're you're looking to to back and, and maybe ones that you're you're less excited to to back? How, how do you sort of see the landscape? Yeah, absolutely. So what we don't do is what we're not really looking for is people who have a, you know, they think Bitcoin's going up, you know, in the next six months and they just kind of go along some Bitcoin or given well, what, today's the 29th of January um, and Dogecoin is up like, what, 500% today. Um, <laughs> we, we can get into that, but uh, kind of not doing that, but more doing things that are systematic, which means it's computers trading and typically trading at high speeds. And they're doing things like arbitrage where you can see that Bitcoin is trading on two different exchanges at a different price. And so you buy it low, you move the Bitcoin to the other exchange and sell it um, for a little bit higher. And so you can make, you know, a couple basis points, for example, on a trade like that, a basis point is a hundredth of a percent. And what that does kind of for, for the market itself is it uh, kind of spreads the liquidity out and means that the prices everywhere stay kind of even. And you don't get kind of craziness on one exchange where, you know, for example, Bitcoin is just way higher than everywhere else or way lower. Um, so it generally just makes for a more orderly market. We look for and speak to people doing arbitrage, people doing market making, which is very linked to arbitrage, um, kind of providing liquidity to markets and and keeping them kind of on a, an even keel. We also, you know, there are people using uh, machine learning, reinforcement networks, things like this to look at past data and and predict where a particular asset is going over the next hour or even day. Um, and they'll make these sort of probabilistic bets on that. And if they're good, they'll make, you know, they'll be correct directionally on that bet, you know, say 50 to 70% of the time. And they'll be able to size the bets. Um, you'll see typically kind of they, they'll make more money on the bets that are right than they lose on the bets that are wrong. So they, that there's an, a kind of sizing aspect to it that's important as well. And um, so, yeah, people doing all sorts of things in these markets, but typically they are what we're focused on is is people trading them quantitatively using computers and, and models. And and for people who may not be as familiar, can you give a brief background of, of what market making is and, and how it works? If you think of pretty much any exchange, they run what's known as an order book, which is where people post orders uh, at a particular price and they say, I'm willing to buy 
you know, let's just think about a Bitcoin market right now. I'm willing to buy, you know, five Bitcoin at uh, 30,000 bucks. And someone else is saying I'm willing to sell five Bitcoin at 40,000 bucks. And then there are people, you know, saying I want to buy five Bitcoin at 20,000 bucks and at 35,000 bucks. And so everybody sort of posts what they're willing to buy or sell at into this order book. And then what the order book does, well, kind of a, a, what's known as a matching engine will come in and basically match orders. So if somebody is saying I'm willing to sell at 30,000 and someone else is saying I'm willing to buy at 30,000, they sort of meet, those two orders meet in the middle and they match and the exchange will make that exchange. That's why it's called an exchange. And so what a market maker will do is basically look at a particular market like you know Bitcoin uh, versus USD on the Binance exchange. And they will post orders in the order book and they will basically be ingesting data from all of the crypto exchanges that they can, real-time data that's telling them, hey, you know, this is what Bitcoin is trading at right now. And so by doing that, they're forming an opinion on what the kind of quote unquote true price of Bitcoin at a given point in time is. And so if on average Bitcoin is trading on all of these different exchanges at 30,000 bucks and someone is is willing to sell it to you for 28,000 bucks, you'll be kind of happy to take that and buy it from them and then sell it somewhere else. So market making is like arbitrage, but at really, really high frequency. And so market makers will basically post orders into the order book saying, I'm willing to buy or sell Bitcoin at these particular prices. And then markets uh, move around. If you zoom in on the chart of any kind of stock or crypto and you zoom in enough, you'll see that it sort of zigzags up and down and that's because you know some buyers are in a hurry to sell and don't really care about the price too much and and others don't and so you come into the market and you'll just say I just want to sell and I don't mind if I sell at 1% higher and so instead of putting a what's known as a limit order in where you just state your intention in the order book and wait for somebody else to match with you you just say I'll take the best price available right now and so you'll see over very very short time horizons like a second or 5 seconds you'll see the market kind of zigzagging up and down inside this narrow band. And market makers will basically be sitting at the bottom of that band saying, we're willing to buy low. And at the top of that band saying, we're willing to buy, we're willing to sell relatively at an expensive uh, price. And so kind of zooming out a little bit, um, what this looks like is, you know, 10, 20, 50,000 small trades a day across lots of different exchanges. And the, the benefit to the exchange and to the people transacting on the exchange um, is that there's more liquidity. So when you want to sell, there's someone there sitting on the other side who's willing to buy. And when you want to buy, there's someone willing to sell to you. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, description. The, and it's a nice segue into uh, what we came to talk about today. Uh, so in our last episode, we focused on you know Bitcoin transitioning into a gold alternative, we talked about institutional moves into the space. And in th- this episode, we wanted to focus on, on crypto market structures. What, what, why don't you unpack why you were excited to, to hop back on the podcast and, uh, and what we're going to talk about. And then let's get into it. Yeah, sure. So, so market structure sounds very wonky and very nerdy, but it's like it is what moves prices in the short term in pretty much all markets. And I think that's important generally, but even more important at the moment um, and quite topical because there's there's a lot of very vocal people at the moment, I think kind of spewing nonsense. And, and that's kind of driven, you know, they see a price moving on something and they come up with these kind of crazy theories as to why. And I, I think it fuels a lot of the, the FUD and the tribalism that we see, especially in the crypto space. Um, and so if we can, you know, spend this hour talking through kind of some vignettes of how markets work and reducing that a little bit. Uh, it'll be an hour well spent. Yeah, and l- let's go into a, a couple scenarios we wanted to, to, to look into. Do you, do you want to start us off with uh, with Tether? Yeah, so Tether, um, oh, th- there was this, um, for anyone who didn't read it, so by way of background, Tether is a stable coin in the crypto space, and it's the dominant stable coin. A stable coin is a uh, crypto token that that is pegged to typically one US dollar. And so you have this kind of crypto asset that you can trade, for example, on Ethereum, that should always be worth a dollar. 
And somebody under the pseudonym Crypto Anonymous posted this article like a, what, a week or two ago now, just basically making some pretty crazy claims. And this article went completely viral. It got written up by a bunch of the kind of news outlets. It made it into mainstream media and everyone just went into this kind of huge kind of frenzy and, and kind of jumped on either the, you know, I knew crypto was a complete fraud bandwagon or the, you know, this is complete nonsense bandwagon. And the, the thing with, I think a lot of the things that this, this article is claiming just make no sense. But the issue is like market structure isn't something you can learn about in a book. You've kind of got to learn about it by being active in the markets and it's always changing. So yeah, we, we can, yeah, we can dive into kind of the core cool claims of that article, which is firstly, the fact that USDT trading on unregulated exchange exchanges proves that it's a fraud. That was kind of the first big claim. And kind of on that point, like, the reason why so Tether was created by a crypto exchange known as Bitfinex, called, called Bitfinex. And Bitfinex was one of the very early exchanges. And it's still true now to some extent, but especially in 2013, 14, 15, getting a bank account as a crypto exchange was pretty much impossible. And if you think, if you kind of imagine that there were kind of a dozen different crypto exchanges around, and there were users that were trying to move funds between those exchanges, it was very, very, very hard to do. And so Bitfinex created a Tether, which was a, a stable coin. And they said, look, like this is going to be backed by $1, which we're going to hold in our bank account. And um, that way, you know, we can just move value in dollars from one exchange to another, and it'll be much easier. And that's why, you know, people started adopting it in the first place. The regulated exchanges today, you know, you think of like Coinbase and, and Kraken, do have fiat rails. So like they connect to the traditional banking system and you can put dollars and pounds and euros into these accounts. But it comes with a massive compliance cost, regulatory regulatory cost. And it means that like their costs are much higher. They can't innovate as quickly. And what we really saw was like Binance came out and, and I think with good intentions specifically decided to be kind of a non-fiat exchange to start with and to not be regulated. And that allowed them to move really, really quickly and to innovate from a product perspective much faster than if they had been regulated. And they sort of ate everyone's lunch. They're kind of the dominant crypto exchange now. And so I think like a lot of people have reacted to that by, um, you know, all of the, almost all of the newcomers and, and some of the existing ones by trying to step away from being too regulated so that they can compete on product innovation. Um, and so Tether and stable coins in general become kind of more and more and more important. And so like the fact that, 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 that USDT trades on unregulated exchanges but doesn't tend to trade on the regulated ones is more to do with the fact that these exchanges can't get bank accounts or don't want to get bank accounts and be dependent on, you know, some US state shutting them down for X or Y reason. And so they're choosing to be sort of crypto stable coin and sometimes like Euro or local currency integrated, but not dollar integrated. And so they use USDT kind of as a, as a proxy for that. So this kind of first claim sort of made no sense. The second is like everybody has pointed towards this and it's been a big controversy in the space. They say, ah, well, you know, Bitcoin price only goes up when the when the total amount of USDT of Tether being issued goes up. And, and they say, you know, that just means that like Tether is printing all of these stable coins and buying Bitcoin with it. And uh, they're running away with the Bitcoin and stealing it. And these people are being left kind of holding a USDT token that they think is worth a dollar, but actually is worth nothing. The, the issue there is like, of course, USDT and Bitcoin prices are going to correlate. Like the, the big price moves happen when new money moves into the space. And so you have like pretty much dollars going into Tether, USDT, and then that goes into Bitcoin. And so those two move in lockstep and that's exactly what you would expect. And so, you know, that's not something you can point to and, and as, as kind of evidence of fraud. And, you know, additionally to that, there are other stable coins out there like DAI. Um, from MakerDAO. And the exact same thing happens to those stable coins as well. And we know that DAI isn't a fraud because it's open source. 
And so you can check. And we know that USDC, another stable coin, which has exactly the same kind of pattern, also isn't a fraud because it's US regulated and it's got regular audits. And then you have like, there's this, so people always point to, um, they say, oh, you know, Tether issuance has grown a lot, which would means, you know, because a Tether supposedly is backed by a dollar, um, when you issue a new Tether, there has to be a US dollar going into Tether's bank account. And so, you know, Tether's only public banking relationship is with a pretty shady bank called Deltec in the Bahamas. And we don't need to get into that, but Bahamian government, actually the central bank, sorry, of the Bahamas publishes a, a report every quarter where they add up all of the ex, kind of uh, foreign exchange reserves of all of the banks in the Bahamas at a given point in time. And um, the latest report I think they've got is kind of from October and Tether had a market cap of about 10 billion and all of the dollars held in the Bahamas, um, according to this, was about 5 billion. And so people point to that and say, you know, it's totally impossible that uh, Tether actually holds all of these, these dollars to back the currency and, and it's all kind of a big fraud. Um, what I think it doesn't leave room for is kind of two important things. The first is the Tether... I, I haven't been able to confirm this, but my, my strong understanding is that they have other banking relationships outside of Deltec with other banks that are not in the Bahamas. And secondly, it's not at all clear to me that, you know, what you would usually do if you're a bank and you're holding billions of dollars is you would take that and you would deposit those dollars with your custodian or like your correspondent bank. You wouldn't just hold them yourself necessarily. It's not at all clear, like from the, the footnotes that, the central bank of, of the Bahamas is counting these kind of um, liabilities in the kind of calculations. So it could just be that all the money is going into Delta. Delta is depositing most of it with some big, big, big bank in the US as a custodian. And that's kind of, that's your mystery solved. Um, and then there's the piece kind of ends with this, uh, like grand reveal um, saying, you know, USDT is like totally unbacked. There are no dollars there. And Bitfinex has just been like selling you these worthless tokens um, for Bitcoin and then like collecting all of the Bitcoin and, and are running just a giant exit scam. I just think that's almost impossible. Like the idea that they, that the Ifinex group that own Tether and, and Bitfinex is pulling a giant exit scam worth like, tens of billions of dollars at this point without any market participants or any of the other exchanges that also use Tether noticing is just not really plausible. I, I've spoken to funds and market participants who've redeemed millions of, Bitcoin, of uh, Tethers from Tether, created millions of Tethers without any issues. It's, it's almost kind of beyond credulity um, that they would be able to pull that off without anyone noticing. And it also doesn't really make any sense. Um, crypto exchanges are an amazing business. Uh, they just print money, real revenues, because there's so much trading happening on them. And like, you know, Bitfinex is probably worth more than Tether's entire market cap. So why would you go and defraud the entire crypto industry for this little kind of what you what was little until kind of you know a few months ago? kind of a stable coin where you're just stealing from everyone when on the other hand, you've got this exchange that's you know immensely profitable, doing super well and is is worth a lot. And then kind of Tether on its own is, is a really interesting business. It's a great little business. Like they charge 20 basis points on every issuance and redemption. And then they invest at least some of their deposits into money market funds that, that yield and it's also like a, a massive positive carry trade on interest rates going up. So basically, like Bitfinex sits on $20 billion ish, and they can take those dollars and they can invest it in a money market fund that's going to yield like one or 2%, something like that. And it's a very low risk, like US treasuries. And that one or 2% goes straight into their pocket. And this is a business that basically costs nothing to run. So I don't know, like 20 billion times 2% is $400 million a year of revenues with almost no cost. Like that's a wonderful business. Why would you go and, and, and kind of run a giant scam if you don't need to? 
that was the Tether article. I don't know if you have any questions on that. No, no, I, I think I that was the... a that was an awesome overview, and and, be, and because I want to make sure we get into to everything, let, let, let let's move on to the uh, the double spend on on Bitcoin uh, a, a couple weeks ago, and I'm 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 more interested in in sort of how to think about it from a broader perspective of of, of what that means in terms of you know how the market reacts to to events like that. Um, I know we're going to get into liquidation cascades. Um, so what when you uh, when you start us off? Yeah, for sure. So. I mean, this is uh, old old news and tether at this point. Like so much has happened in the past week. But uh, if, if anyone still remembers, in it was about sort of mid-January, I think, somebody reported a double spend on Bitcoin. And so basically that somebody had spent the same Bitcoin twice, which shouldn't happen, obviously, because one of the core kind of underpinnings of Bitcoin having any value is that it's finite. You can't just like, copy paste your Bitcoin and then have double the Bitcoin and spend both of those. And like what, what actually happened is something that's quite kind of normal and, and pedestrian and uh, Anton- Antonopoulos, um, Andreas Antonopoulos has, has posted some like really good uh, kind of explainers of what happened, but like basically, well, I actually, I won't get into it. Go look at what he's written. He'll do a, a kind of far better job than me, but the, the kind of market reaction to that, um, you sort of had, you know, really badly researched piece of journalism that was just wrong, came out, and suddenly Bitcoin crashed twenty percent, and suddenly, like all over Twitter, is you know some people being like, ah, oh, you know, Bitcoin's broken, it's been hacked, and then other people, you know, saying, ah, oh, you know, some whale has just dumped on us, and like everybody's selling, and you know, panic, panic, panic. I think it's it's really difficult for people to understand what price does in the short term, if they don't understand how markets are positioned when you go into the the event that triggers that. And so in this case, you had basically this news article that came out and you know, certainly some people will have, have sold either because they themselves got scared or because they anticipated that a lot of the, you know, maybe new money in the space that doesn't understand how Bitcoin works at a technical level would freak out and sell. And I, I've got a friend of a friend that, that that did exactly that. They saw the article, they went, oh my God, Bitcoin's broken and they sold it. But the market at the time had been building and building and building the level of leverage. And a lot of trading in crypto is leveraged. And the thing with leverage is you have a, you know, let's say you want to take up 10X leverage. And so you'll deposit 10 Bitcoin and you'll go 10X levered. And so you'll go long 100 Bitcoin with the 10 Bitcoin of collateral that you've posted. If the market drops 10% from like, so if your Bitcoin drops 10% in value, so from 100 down to 90, that will effectively wipe out your 10 of collateral. And at that point, the exchange will take over your position and close you out. What actually happens is that the exchange will do that at like 91, because they know that it's going to take them some time to take over your position and liquidate it. And they might not be able to sell it at 91. There might be what's known as slippage, where as they're selling, the price is also going down. And so what they don't want is uh, to kind of be on the hook for the other side of the trade who's owed money. And so, you know, you've got your 10 to 1 leverage, Bitcoin drops 10% or, you know, more like 8% and your position is taken over and just sold into the market at whatever price the exchange can get. And that obviously pushes the price down further. And then you've got the next guy who maybe had used like 9x leverage um, and who was safe until the price hit like $89 and, or, you know, had, had dropped like 11%. And at that point, they get liquidated. And so the exchange, again, takes over that position and sells it into the market. And you create these cascades, what, what are known as liquidation cascades, where some guy who was super, super highly levered on, for example, Bitcoin has like tiny amount of margin for error in the price of Bitcoin. Like if it drops just a little bit, he's going to get liquidated. And when he gets liquidated, that pushes the price down. And then the next most levered guy also gets liquidated. And you get these cascades where you just get chains and chains of people that because of you know the first guy's liquidation, it liquidates the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. And you get these crazy kind of drops and more often than not, when you know people see a, a really violent move, uh, especially downwards, 
in Bitcoin or, or kind of any crypto market. It's because you've had one of these cascades. It's not because someone's coming, typically not because someone's coming to the market and just said, all right, I'm going to just dump like a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin right now just for fun. And so you have this kind of interesting thing where you get like a really small news event is like the butterfly who kind of spreads its wings and, and, and flaps once and it's innocuous, but the chain reaction of events that happens after that results in, in these kind of crazy moves. The same thing can also uh, uh, explains a lot of what happened in March. So like on, on the 12th of March, 2020, you know, the world was, was kind of in a crazy place, but uh, financial markets and crypto were under a lot of stress. And you just had this like cascade of liquidations and Bitcoin dropped, I think it was like 40% in 12 hours. Um, and a, a lot, it, it bounced straight back up again afterwards because everyone who was levered had been liquidated or had posted more margin. And so like the market then cleared and everyone went, oh my God, Bitcoin's at three and a half K, we need to buy. So yeah, the, it, these kind of liquidation cascades are quite interesting and it's actually something that can be traded. So if you if you sort of zoom in on exactly what happens at, at that point in time, you've got an, an order book, if we go back to that, um, where suddenly a ton of Bitcoin is being liquidated by the exchange and is being put in that order book. And you have an imbalance between the amount that's offered for sale kind of at any price and what's available to buy. And it will basically... You can, you can actually see this visually if you look at an order book for an exchange. Um, so like on Coinbase, you can go and look at the order book on Coinbase Pro, and you can actually see this kind of happening in real time. But you get these order book imbalances. And so some of the traders we work with will just be looking specifically for that, and they'll make a bet when they see it, like a very quick kind of tactical bet. And they'll say, it looks like the market's you know about to crash or is mid- in the middle of a crash that's going to cascade through lots of people's positions and they will short Bitcoin at just that point in time. And kind of as soon as the cascade has ended and everyone who is to leave it is, is sort of wiped out, they'll close the position out. So there's, there's all sorts of kind of market, this is kind of market structure, but like features of the market uh, like this, that, that the kinds of people we speak to are, are kind of looking for and, and try and trade. I wanted to go even deeper on, on liquidation cascades and, and how they you know, think about it in, in an even broader construct because we were talking earlier about how uh, this relates to what's happening right now and with GameStop. Can you can you go deeper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is kind of the this is the opposite. So like a liquidation cascade is a good example of a huge overreaction to the downside. And what's happened with GameStop? I, I'm sure everybody will know about this by the time it comes out, but. Like FinTwit has absolutely exploded. There's this kind of like end of the road kind of backwater stock or company called GameStop, which is, as far as I know, like they're, they're a bricks and mortar retailer for for, for video games. And, uh, you know, this is, they're publicly traded on the stock market. So we're moving out of crypto, but kind of the same dynamics hold. And um, GameStop is worth like, I don't know, a billion or, or $2 billion worth of market cap. I think the stock was sort of bouncing around $20. Um, and there's this uh, Reddit group called Wall Street Bets um, where a bunch of uh, like foul-mouthed uh, <laughs> gamblers sort of just like congregate and, and have a laugh about you know, just crazy stock bets they make. And this guy uh, went and just sort of started this... Uh, it's called Deep Fucking Value. I don't think we know who he is, but that's his uh, his handle on, on Reddit. He was just like long uh, GameStop calls, so call options. And enough people basically piled onto that trade that it forced the price of GameStop up from like $20 to, I think, like as we're speaking, the peak was at like three or 500 bucks. So just like a massive, massive run. Um, and the way this works is like not because everyone's buying the stock. It's because everyone is buying the call options. And a call option is a type of derivatives contract called an option. Um, when you buy it, it gives you the right to buy a particular stock at a particular price for a, a period of time. So you know if the stock's trading at 20, 
you can buy a call option at $30 that expires in three months. Um, and the person that sells you that is basically saying like, I'm willing for you to, to uh, sorry, to, to buy GameStop from me at $30 for the next three months. And so you buy this and you hope that GameStop goes from $20 to, for example, $40 during that three months. And if it does, you can buy GameStop from the guy at 30 and you can sell it in the open market at 40 and you've made a profit of 10 minus whatever kind of uh, premium or whatever you paid for the option. So you can, you can basically express a bullish view on a, on a particular stock without actually putting much of the capital up because the price of, of, of the premium that you've paid might be just $1. And so this guy buys a, and I think it is a guy, buys a call option on GameStop. And the person that sells you an option is typically an options market maker, basically like a professional counterparty rather than like some random person on the street. And what the counterparty does, especially if they're an options market maker, is they don't have a view on whether GameStop is going up or down. They're doing this across like thousands of stocks. So they have absolutely no view. And so, well, they will be thinking about like how likely it is that GameStop is going to go up to $30 in the next month based on how it's been trading in the past. And I'll say, you know, this is not a very volatile stock. It hasn't moved in years. It's very unlikely that this is going to $30. So, you know, we're willing to sell that call to someone for quite a cheap price. And so let's imagine you buy that call like for a dollar. When you do that, they're looking at this and saying, well, you know, we need to hedge ourselves just in case it does go up. And so what they'll do, they'll go long the stock. So they'll buy a little bit of stock to hedge themselves. But because they think it's very unlikely that the stock's going to go all the way from 20 to 30, if they sold you a call on 100 shares, they're probably not going to buy 100 shares themselves. They'll just buy a little bit, like two or three or four shares. Let's say five shares. And they'll say, you know, this is kind of a, an appropriate hedge because at least we have a little bit of exposure to GameStop if it goes up. And if it you know, continues to go up and it seems more and more likely that we're actually going to have to pay this guy on the call option, well, we'll buy a little bit more so that we're completely hedged. And so you have this, um, this is known as Delta, but you have this situation where somebody buys a call option that's what's known as really far out of the money. So basically very unlikely to happen. And when they do that, the market maker that sells it to them has to buy a little bit of the stock just to sort of hedge themselves a little bit. And then in doing so, you then have the next guy that comes in and buys another call option. And so the options market maker has to buy a little bit more stock because it's just sold another call, needs to buy a bit more stock to hedge itself on that contract. And then someone comes in and buys another and another and another. And suddenly what you have is a bunch of people buying that same call option and forcing the market maker to buy more and more stock in order to hedge themselves. And as the market maker does that, they're obviously pushing the price of the stock up. But the more the stock price goes up, the more likely it is that this call is actually going to be in the money, that the stock is going to get to $30 or more, and they're actually going to have to pay out on it. And so as the price goes up and nears that $30 mark, the market maker is hedging themselves more and more, which means they're going and buying even more stock to hedge themselves. And so the price goes up, that makes it more likely that they're going to have to pay out on this contract. So they have to hedge themselves against that possibility even more. So they buy more stock that pushes the price up, causing them to buy more stock and hedge themselves more. And you have this kind of circular dynamic. And this is known as a basically a gamma short squeeze. Um, and I won't get into that because it gets a bit complicated. But what essentially happened is that a bunch of people realized that, you know, a lot of people were, were short the stock and, and we can kind of ignore that for now because it doesn't apply to crypto so much. But a bunch of people bought these call options. And in doing so, they forced market makers to buy a ton of the stock. And in doing so, that pushed the price up, which forces them to buy even more. And so these calls are suddenly that these guys bought are suddenly you know valuable because the stock's gone from 20 to 40 bucks. They spent one dollar to buy a call that is now worth you know, say 10 bucks. So the difference between 40 and 30. 
10 bucks minus the premium that they paid. And so they put a dollar in and they've already got $10 out. So they and their friends are like, this is awesome. Let's buy more. And then there are people, you know, hedge funds and professionals also watching this who are saying, Jesus, this is crazy. You know, GameStop has just gone viral and all of the retail crowds buying into it. I'm going to piggyback off this. And so they buy some calls as well. And it becomes this meme where everybody is buying the calls that forces the dealers, the market makers to buy more of the stock to hedge themselves. And the price just goes up and up and up and up. And so we had this squeeze that went from 20 bucks to like 500. And it was kind of all caused. And this happened in like four or five days. And it's probably not over. I don't know what GameStop's done today. I haven't checked yet. But until all of the shorts have kind of bought back the stock and until the dealers are able to, to properly hedge themselves on this, I think kind of this, the only way this ends is uh, either that or they need to just stop people buying calls because um, it, it just kind of feeds on itself. And so it's kind of interesting because it's this, it's this weaponization of, of gamma and of, of options um, that's, that's happened that I think, you know, there was some of this on the kind of 90s kind of stock boards on, on Usenet and, and the early internet. But what we're seeing with, with Wall Street bets at the moment is kind of an amazing, and not in a good way, but just amazing kind of social phenomenon where people are just sort of angry and, and out to get kind of quote unquote the hedge funds. It, it's, it's been a really interesting kind of social mimetic kind of thing to watch. What do you think it, it means or what do you think the big implications for, for what changes because of the events that have happened in the past you know, few weeks that of course have been building up for a while, but where, where do you see this going forward? Say more about, I'm curious one, as it relates to crypto, if, uh, uh, you know, because there's some parallels, uh, you know, culturally, but but also practically. Um, but then also just yeah, more broadly, what does this mean going forward? So, I mean, I thought kind of in the short term that there was a chance that like stock trading was just going to suck all of the kind of oxygen out of the room and crypto trading and would just get forgotten. And like everyone would just be focused on on stock trading and, and all of the craziness over there. And then... What happened is is the brokers, so the like the app or the website that you go on to actually trade, like Robinhood, Interactive Brokers, E-Trade, Fidelity, um, these brokers basically went into, on, on these particular stocks like GameStop, and there were a couple of others, they went into what's known as reduce only mode, where they'll let you trade, but only if your trade moves you out of the position. So if you're long a call, the only thing you can do is sell your call. You can't buy a new call. And like th- this basically happened like yesterday and today and FinTwit and has just gone absolutely nuts over it. And and now there's this, you know, Bitcoin's jumped. That's partly because, you know, Elon Musk unhelpfully put like Bitcoin and the Bitcoin logo in his, uh, in his Twitter um, bio. And everyone just went crazy over that. And, a lot of these guys who were trading on retail ex- uh, brokerage exchanges who were trading stocks are saying like, you know, screw this. It's totally rigged. You know, the Fed's trying to screw us and shut us down. Let's go into crypto where it trades 24 seven and like no one tells us what to do. And, and I think that's my pretty strong understanding is that this is not, you know, the Fed didn't tap the brokerage exchanges on the shoulder and say, you know, let's screw the little guy and just stop them from trading and stop them making money because we hate them, which seems to be what everyone on on Twitter seems to be saying, including like uh, AOC. Like there's been some pretty crazy stuff said by like members of the US government or like representatives, like elected representatives. That's just completely untrue. I think the way this works is if you're a brokerage, you need to, you need to post your own collateral with the clearing houses. So like when a trade happens, it doesn't settle immediately. And so it'll settle a couple of days later and this all gets really complicated, but basically as a brokerage, you know, you have a certain amount of deposits by law that you have to keep with the clearing house. And this is mandated in in Dodd-Frank, like this was a post 2008 reform to try and make markets safer and not screw the little guy. And what happened is like volatility went up a lot so the amount of deposits being required by the, the clearing houses went up a lot. 
And suddenly these exchanges are saying, well, you know, we don't have the cash to hand. Like we don't have, we've already posted an additional like 500 million of cash as collateral. We just don't have an extra billion dollars to hand. And so what we need to do is just like reduce the size of the positions and therefore of our risk. Um, and so I think that's kind of what's driven that. But, you know, kind of more worrying to me is that you you go on on, on the news or on Twitter and, and people are just like really mad. And, and like, it's obvious that there's a lot of anger floating around, but people are just pointing a finger at, at someone as a convenient bad guy. And everybody just kind of jumps on the bandwagon and uh, like, it, it sort of makes no sense. Like people are getting angry about stuff that's completely wrong. And I get that you can be angry, but at least people should be angry. I think about the right things. And so it's been, it's been, a, I don't know what's going to happen longer time. I think that there's something to be said for just leaving markets to clear, um, which is what we have in crypto. Like we basically don't have intervention in crypto markets. And in March, when everything was collapsing, crypto was sort of the only market in the world that didn't get bailed out. Um, and I think the fact that it survived that is is really like a testament to it, because that wouldn't have been true, I don't think, of, of currency markets or equities or of, uh, most importantly, maybe fixed income, so bonds. My guest today has been David Fauchier. David, for, for people who are you know fascinated by this conversation and, and want to go deeper into your work, um, wh- where might you point them? Um, sure. So uh, feel free to reach out on Twitter. My handle is uh, at dfauchier, at D-F-A-U-C-H-I-E-R. Otherwise, you can contact us uh, at, at nickel.digital, or I'm sure you can figure out my email if, if you're motivated. But yeah, to reiterate, if, if you're a trader in this space, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, hopefully, we can be helpful one way or another. Um, and maybe there's a kind of a working relationship for us to, to figure out. But yeah, it's what we do all day long. Please reach out. Thanks so much for coming back on the podcast, David. Eric, thank you so much for, for having me. It's been really fun. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Check us out at villageglobal.vc.